All right. Thank you so very much. I see my participant number going up. Therefore, I know persons are now coming in through the auditorium. Maybe they're leaving the virtual exhibitors booths. Uh, I certainly hope you had the opportunity while you have your breaks, while you have your downtime or we're transitioning from one uh, session to the next, please ensure that you go and visit our exhibitors booth simply because there's just so much diversity there. Over 45 uh, booths are there uh, with resources and information that you can certainly take back and implement in your various and respective uh, spaces and communities. Welcome to our very first panel discussion. It's, it's, it's a brilliant topic, and I'm so happy that we're kicking off the SDM Summit with this particular topic. Now, as we come to the end of the session, please look out for a poll. You know, we value your feedback, and we want to hear from you. We want to always know how we can improve uh, in terms of serving you. So look out for that poll as we come to the end. Now, we have gotten a, a fantastic and a diverse first group of panelists who will take on the topic, One Caribbean, how we enable regional and uh, regional integration through digital transformation. We've been speaking about this One Caribbean. We've been speaking about us being together and collaborating, but how simple is it? Are we integrated? Can we be more integrated? And how do we leverage our digital transformation? Uh, our very first panelist, who will uh, weigh in on this topic is Dr. Janice Remy, Director of Shridath Ramphal Center for International Trade Law Policy and Services. And just to give a little bit about her, uh, she's an international trade lawyer and Caribbean integration law specialist who over the course of her 15 year career has advised governments and private stakeholders on Caribbean integration, international trade matters, with focus on litigating disputes under the auspices of the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO. I'm extremely uh, intrigued to hear what she has to say, simply because we're busy buying permits and going through a lot of diplomacy and red tape, but how can we integrate? Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together as we welcome Dr. Janice Remy to the stage. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. Uh, I assume I'm being heard and seen, so I'm just going to start really quickly um, so we don't have that much time. So if can everybody see my screen? Just give me a thumbs up. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a thesis statement uh, for your consideration, which is the region's promise of integration is literally one click away and all that now prevents us from achieving that integration is our own imagination. That, my friends, is my thesis for my presentation over the next 10 minutes. I be, and by the end of these 10 minutes, I hope you will form your own view about the sageness of my words. As one person has described it, there are no boundaries or borders in a digital age. Traditional challenges like geographic distance, historical ties, language, and other things evaporate as digital technologies afford us the opportunity to connect with anyone, anywhere, and at any time. Casey Turgeson of the World Bank described digital connectivity as a basic building block for economic productivity, like electricity or roads. You cannot simply be part of the global economy without it today. It stands to reason, therefore, that digital transformation in the Caribbean must be strategically leveraged to drive regional integration and our global insertion. So let's look very briefly at what CARICOM has done so far in the realm of digital transformation. From 2008 to 2013, there was something called a harmonization of ICT policies and legislation across the Caribbean, popularly known as the HIPCAR project. And this project produced model guidelines and legislative texts for ICT frameworks developed to provide CARICOM member states with a unified approach towards uh, ICT development. But to date, it appears, unfortunately, that few member states have actually enacted legislation based on that model law. Then there was the World Bank funded OECS Electronic Government for Regional Integration Project, or EGRIP, which was approved all the way back in 2008 to develop regionally integrated e government applications across the OECS countries, or some of them at least. Results from this project included a development of a regionally harmonized e government legislation presented to the OECS authorities in 2012 
and e-government applications, etc. That as well has had a limited uptake. In 2017, the CARICOM single ICT space vision and roadmap was approved by CARICOM heads of government. And this single space was envisioned to be the digital layer of the CSME, seeking to have regionally harmonized policy, regulatory, and legislative regimes, uh, robust broadband infrastructure. Certainly, if successfully developed and implemented, this would have been a powerful enabler of regional integration. More recently, we have the DCASH project among OECS countries that has been recently rolled out and aims to connect the region through the ECCB's digital currency, which is making it easier, faster, and cheaper to send and receive EC currency within and across participating countries. Now, during COVID, the thrust for the digital was accelerated and it became a national and regional priority. As Tahseen Syed of the World Bank said, the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the central role of digital technology in keeping people, businesses, governments, and countries connected. And the Eastern Caribbean received $94 million for a Caribbean digital transformation project. And this project aims to increase access to digital services and technologies and skills by government businesses and individuals. Now, what I like to do is often move from the government-led programs, which I've given you a background of, and capture what I consider to be really the thrust of the digital transformation movement happening across the Caribbean. As in other parts of the world, it is the young entrepreneurial class, at times supported by enabling institutional actors and governments that are really leading the way. And we wanted in this presentation to illustrate how these entrepreneurs are actually leading the way in this field. I want to start with the Tech Beach Retreat, the TBR, founded by Caribbean entrepreneurs, Kirk Anthony Hamilton and Kyle Maloney, which seeks to connect top tech players globally with the undiscovered talent and opportunities in our part of the world. In their words, they say, we're focused on building bridges that yield increased investment, partnership, and mentorship, spurring an entrepreneurship and innovation revolution. We're merging assets of some of the world's foremost people and organizations with the unrealized full potential of people and organizations poised for success. And if you visit the website, you will see some eye-watering accelerated programs through their, uh, their tech lab or through their summits. Um, but leveraging a regional market, many of the developers, the developers I've spoken to say still face regulatory and other problems relating to lack of a harmonized approach to regulation. So although they can dream and develop the applications to really facilitate the cross-border uh, trade in their, in their apps, they still face these regulatory hurdles. A second example I want to pay tribute to is WePay, which was developed as a direct result of the persistent challenges with digital payments and lack of financial inclusion in the Caribbean. And many people have heard about its founder, Aldwin Wayne, who seeks to create a payments ecosystem that empowers people in the region through a network that allows secure and flexible transactions. And today it is a top payment platform in many Caribbean countries. We pay, in my view, is evidence that there's an innovative appetite and entrepreneurial spirit in the region. And they are seeking challenges as opportunities rather than being daunted by the obstacles. There's also a, a feeling like you get at Google or Facebook that a lot of this is being informed by the young people. The average employee at WePay is 25 years old. Uh, and as Aldwin himself has highlighted, we are a technology company that has fun as we work. We don't take ourselves as seriously as traditional financial institutions and instead embrace a lighter work environment that allows our team to focus on getting the best products out there. And then the third instance I want to kind of pay tribute to, because I am at the university, is the B Mobile UE Innovation Lab powered by Huawei which is the result of a tripartite agreement between global tech giant Huawei, 
that has donated over two million US dollars in equipment, local telecoms provider B-Mobile, upon which the network, the equipment will be configured. And the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus, where the state-of-the-art innovation lab will be built. And this lab is expected to become the center of innovation in the Caribbean. Now, in the interest of time, I'll go to my next slide, which looks at well, what is what are the problems that are currently being faced? And I'll name just a few of them. One is obviously no surprise to anyone, this limited access to finance. Although starting a business may be easier compared to other parts of the world, getting credit remains extremely difficult, as evidenced by the region's low scores on the World Bank's doing business. Um, and similarly, we need to explore innovating financing models, such as angel investing, crowdfunding, junior stock exchanges, leveraging the diaspora, and other avenues to support our entrepreneurs financially. A second problem relates to limited networks and safety nets. So Kirk Hamilton has said that the Caribbean tech startups fail because of lack of experience, limited networks, and very little safety nets to bolster them against the challenges of starting an innovative business. And a third perennial problem that we encounter as we look at the problems is this lack of the legislative and regulatory frameworks that are needed. Uh, we don't have enough widespread harmonized approach to cybersecurity, data protection, privacy legislation, and even in degenerating innovation, intellectual property product protection systems. I want to end really, because I know my 10 minutes is almost up, is how do we go forward? Um, and I think the Caribbean Commission on the Economy, which recently uh, released its report last year, tried to come up with some ways that we can use and overcome existing structures in CARICOM to build this digital transformation. And they said, there are a couple of things that CARICOM can do. We can remove artificial barriers against free movement within the community of digital services through mutual recognition agreements or minimum common standards. We can have digital employment contracts that allow workers to work remotely across member states without requiring a work permit. We can eliminate roaming charges by the big telecom providers. It still costs thousands of dollars to roam within CARICOM. How are we going to generate business that way? Establishing digital addresses for all locations and entities and looking at the possibilities of geocoding. Digitizing the public sector to increase public engagement with digital technologies. And this is one of my favorites because I know we lose $100 million per year in CARICOM, encouraging greater regional procurement of locally and regionally developed software and technologies to drive demand and create a resilient regional tech industry. And so as I end, one of the things the Caribbean economy suggested is that we need to move from the current governance board model at CARICOM, where we need all members to agree in order to move forward, to let a critical mass of five CARICOM members that wish to move on digital transformation to do so and allow others to follow. And this recommendation intends to address the major implementation deficit that we still have in CARICOM. And in my view, it's the only way forward. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you so much. My goodness, what a way to start off this particular discussion. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Remy, really comprehensive. You gave us a fantastic overview. You, you gave us the, um, the, the, the success stories, which shows us that people are doing it and that we are capable of doing this. But then, you know, being very open and honest about the realities of what do we lack and where does this framework come from? You know, who, how do we go about um, creating this harmony so that all of us can benefit, that we can become this hub. When you said that CARICOM loses $100 million to the procurement process, my mind was blown. And we want to remind I think Go right ahead and drop your questions as quickly as possible. 
and then we will move on. So we just heard from Dr. Remy, fantastic way to start off. So now we're moving to Mr. Bevel Wooding. You know, the world is advancing while policymakers and technocrats are stuck in a time warp. Where are we? You know, where, when do we truly get there? This is something that I hope he will be able to answer. But let me tell you just a little bit about Mr. Wooding. He's the Director of Caribbean Affairs with the American Registry for Internet Numbers, a US-based nonprofit agency responsible for administration of internet number resources in the Caribbean. He also serves in an advisory capacity to several Caribbean government and regional institutions, including the OECS, Caribbean Telecommunications Union, and Caribbean Court of Justice on Technology, Education, Cybersecurity, and the Digital Economy. Put your hands together as we welcome Bevel Wooding virtually. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Reed. And, uh, and thank you also, Dr. Remy, for setting such a wonderful platform for, for this discussion. I've been asked to talk about the, the issue of enabling regional integration through digital transformation. And, uh, and I think Dr. Remy uh, outlined some of the very real and very um, practical initiatives taking place across the, the, the region that are worthy of celebration. We have innovators, we have entrepreneurs. And uh, the, the thing I wanted to open with is, is this simple fact. Entrepreneurs will be entrepreneurial. Innovators will always seek ways to innovate. But for us to get to uh, an environment in which we say we have a robust, healthy, sustainable, um, digitally transformed uh, ecosystem, we need to create an environment around them. And I can speak about this from several standpoints. Uh, I started a software company in a previous life. Uh, we had great ambitions to remain in the Caribbean and move out uh, to the world while building and, and sustaining our ideas from within the Caribbean. Um, part of a nonprofit organization established in the Caribbean and now operating in 110 countries. Uh, we have been moving up and down across this region, uh, looking at ways in which we can become one. And I want to share with you some of the, 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 the experiences that have come out of that in framing this issue of enabling regional integration, um, regional integration through digital transformation. And I want to just break down that title uh, in a way that I hope um, our listeners will appreciate. Because when we talk about regional integration, we have to ask ourselves, integrating for what? Integrating to what end? Um, this is not integration in a vacuum. Uh, when we talk about digital transformation, transforming from what to what becomes a fundamental initiating consideration. Uh, people uh, often hear the term digital transformation linked with buzzwords like cloud computing and AI and digital IDs and blockchain um, and internet infrastructure. But these terms and the technology that, that underpin them are ultimately always servants of some development agenda whether that development agenda is institutional, whether it's for a business, uh, whether it is for a government, uh, whether it is for an agency, or whether it is national or even regional, there is some guiding, um, anchoring magnetic pull into the future that defines our aspirations or our goals. And I think it's important for us to frame the issue of transformation in this context, because the technology is useless without that context to determine its it's, it's utility, it's functionality. So when we think of digital transformation, I want us to think of it as the integration of technology basically into all areas of business, all areas of institutional life, whether that is um, local or regional. But I want us to think about it as, as it, the technology being applied for a purpose. The, and, and, and in this case, that purpose is the fundamental and often radical change in how we operate and how we deliver value, whatever that means. If it's for a business, that would be to customers. If it's for a court or a public service um, organization, it will be to citizens. But the idea is that the, the technology is supposed to enable some betterment, some advancement, some enhancement, some expansion that is relative to the applier of that technology. But wrapped up inside of the issue of digital transformation, there's also the issue of cultural change, the paradigm shift that is required for organizations to go from one state to another, to break from what, what many call the, the status quo 
or to upend the status quo and continually um, challenge how we're doing things and why we're doing things. So when you, when you think of the, the, the term digital transformation in, in these ways, um, you, you start to see much less of a technological issue and much more of a, a leadership issue, much more of a, a human application of available and appropriate tools issue. And uh, one of the things that I, I, I want to pull from Dr. Remy's um, presentation is the extent to which organizations and institutions in this region have attempted to apply technology to specific local and regional challenges with varying degrees of success. Um, I myself am responsible, for example, for the Caribbean Agency for Justice Solutions. Uh, we built software that was designed to automate and, and, um, and enhance the use of technology and the digitalization of our, our justice sector within courts and law offices and bar associations. We sat down with judiciaries, we sat down with, with, with attorneys to figure out how can we break the bottlenecks? How can we remove the backlog? How can we um, exercise technology in a way that actually allows us to make justice more accessible, more equitable, more efficient? And, and, and so many of the examples she gave, uh, persons, innovators, businessmen, um, philanthropically minded persons have, have sought to address Caribbean challenges in that context. In our particular case at Apex, the Caribbean Agency for Justice Solutions, the, the philosophy driving it, that vision was to create a sustainable regional ecosystem that supported every aspect, every aspect of the court's uh, technological infrastructure. We said, it's not sufficient to build software. We need, we need organizations certified across the region capable of supporting the deployment of technology in the courts. And I'm using this example to give you a sense of, of the stack or the, the, the layers that are involved in a transformation initiative. We encountered issues that many of the, 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 the examples given earlier uh, also ran into, uh, apathy, um, ignorance, unawareness, enthusiasm to interest, curiosity, uh, cultural aversion to local solutions. We encountered it all. People who had a preference to bring out um, systems from outside, not because they were necessarily better, but because there's a perception that there's greater value and, and, um, and it is more tested than those things that come from within. Uh, there are cultural biases that we encountered and that many innovators I'm sure listening in would, would be able to relate to very, very well. So if we, if we, if we step back uh, and we had to do this for the agency and I've had to do this in, in, um, in the nonprofit work that I'm doing and in the private sector work that I, um, I'm also responsible for. And you start to think of the, the issues inside of digital transmission, you see two sides. One is the tremendous promise, the tremendous potential. For the jurisdictions that have taken up the, the court software, for example, we are talking about immediate uh, cost savings in moving from paper-based systems to digital systems. We're talking about substantial time frame um, improvements in processing files no more paper-based um, filing, moving to electronic filing, uh, registries able to respond more swiftly, judges able to get their, their papers together and do their research much more quickly. The benefits are obvious. But then we also recognize the challenges, the issues that are more structural, that a single company, a single entrepreneur or a single innovator cannot, um, cannot tackle. And those things like the, 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 the cost of doing business in different regions as a regional service provider, uh, things like the education, the digital literacy that persons inside of, of the profession aren't coming out with a suitable degree or capacity to understand how to appropriate the technology. So you have available technology built in a very innovative and pioneering way, but then you have a target audience who still does not value automation or digitalization or even efficiency, uh, even customer service improvement. And then we also recognize a tremendous gap in, in, in research, just the quantifiable um, interpretation of the nature of the status quo to be able to appropriately um, design interventions and engagement with the stakeholders. So, I want to, to in, in, in laying that out, I want us to understand when we talk about transformation, we are talking about something that is, is nuanced, something that is layered. And I want to close by simply, uh, by giving you a sense of 
what I consider the anatomy of digital transformation. And I, I, I will use I will use this. Um, let me see if I can get this this up for you. I will use a simple chart to, to describe what is what it is we are looking at here. Let me just get this up. There we go. Yeah. So, so you have, in terms of the anatomy of the digital transformation, you have several elements that I want us to, to just bear in mind as we go through this panel discussion. The philosophy is important, a guiding vision, something that says how we use the technology, how we determine the design or architecture of our application of technology as we transform. But you have to have the frameworks, and Dr. Remy also indicated that the legislation, the policy, the regulation has to be in support of the transformation that we seek. But even those two aren't sufficient if there is no enabling context, the education, the incentives, the investment, the financial um, opportunities, the monitoring and research, the enforcement and consequences. I'm laying these out. We can't go into detail, obviously, in, in a, a time frame like this. But I want us to see it as a stack that if we put attention to all of the components, the ecosystem or that sustainable model will have an opportunity to be successful. The last two elements would be engagement. And that's the whole issue of building awareness. I have, for example, in the context of, of Apex, we now have to go to judges, go to jurisdictions, go to lawyers and describe to them the benefits of the particular service and the particular philosophy that we are going after as an institution seeking change and transformation in a sector. The cultural shift, um, defining models that people can refer to and practices that they can lay hold of. And of course, demonstrating the value. Many of you may have heard me say before, people hear better when they can see. And so we have to give examples that are living and, and, and real that allow us to amplify our messaging around the change that we want to see. And of course, the last layer, which perhaps is the most significant, is leadership. Leadership enabling um, the environment, leadership inspiring the people, leadership committed to building indigenous capacity. I want to leave us with this anatomy of digital transformation and hand back over to our moderator. Thank you for the time. And I hope this was a useful um, contribution to the discussion. Oh, thank you so very much, Mr. Wooding. In fact, a message just came in the chat asking if you could kindly somehow get that slide either in the chat or, uh, or present it as a resource for them. I found that actually very, very useful. You laid it out, even though you didn't have a lot of time, you laid it out in terms of having the vision, the architecture, having the legislation and the regulatory framework, you know, then having the education, the investment, the research, the opportunity is creating space for engagement and then of course the leadership uh, I can see why most people would want that slide but what I really appreciate uh, that you were able to add to what Dr. Remy said earlier and this is the point of this panel discussion is that you made it very clear that digital transformation is not a buzzword you know it's not having multiple devices and thinking that everything is cool because you know how to use airpods that's not what digital transformation is but it is a radical change it is also a cultural change. It is very layered. And so we have to be able to tackle this entire ecosystem. But the most important thing that, that, that really resonated with me is that you said digital transformation must be rooted in purpose. Once people have a vision, they have a purpose, they have a challenge, then they can leverage that technology to bring about the advancement, the expansion, the progress, and the value. Thank you so very much for that. Ooh. So Mr. Wooding just made way and make sure you get your slide over to us. Okay, Mr. Wooding. So he makes way for our very next uh, uh, panelist, uh, uh, Himat Singh Sandhu, you know, while we fight or quibble about regional integration, a new type of trade emerged, you know, that of digital nomad e-commerce. And so where are we with that in terms of the Caribbean? You know, what role do we play? Um, Himat Singh Sandhu is a digital development specialist with the World Bank's digital development global practice. He advises governments on designing and implementing strategies to expand broadband access to all and invest in the foundations of the digital economies. He works with governments in the Europe and Central Asia and Latin America and Caribbean regions on a combination of national and regional level engagements. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot wait to hear what Himat Singh Sandhu has to say. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Dr. Reed. Uh, and um, 
thank you everyone for giving me this chance to actually participate in, in this panel and, and engage with this audience. Um, so honestly, uh, the, what we've heard so far from Dr. Remy and from uh, Bevel, uh, it's, it's making me throw out my notes uh, in my, on my digital platform in front and I've got my book out <laughs> and going back analog to really pick on some of these points because I, I really do see some synergies here in not just the work that all of our organizations and we have done together, but how we are viewing the entire realm of digital transformation. So I thought maybe just to kind of piece together some of the discussion points that have come up so far, um, maybe we talk a little bit about what is the digital economy and digital transformation and get into the how, right? So the what in terms of what we see uh, as outcomes is, is perhaps what gets, dis what gets discussed a lot. We, we hear artificial intelligence, we hear things like, oh, the digital economy is, you know, 15% of global GDP, it could account for trillions of dollars in the future. Um, data transactions and cross border data flows account for $3 trillion of uh, global revenues, apparently, as per uh, a McKinsey report, but we hear all of these things. But what is it really? So the way we view uh, the digital economy at the World Bank and uh, how also, I mean, the way we've been engaging with the client countries, uh, more and more so is that the digital economy is merely just a modernization of your traditional economy, right? Which gives you certain tools, certain technologies, certain ways of accessing information, markets, uh, inputs, talent, and uh, doing all of this in a more seamless, low cost, low transaction time and low transaction cost uh, manner. And essentially it, it's a way of incorporating innovation into society, right? It's, it's not something new. Uh, taking a traditional business model or traditional business, uh, giving it uh, a, a digital, let's say, um, a digital makeover doesn't, doesn't really transform, uh, doesn't really create a digital business out of it, right? We, when, uh, as entrepreneurs, when you're thinking of solving problems, you're truly thinking of adopting the latest available technology in today's day and age to be able to do that. Um, now, COVID, of course, has accelerated our entire discussion around digital transformation. And I think it has uh, pretty much uh, ident uh, shown us how digital transformation isn't a destination as a lot of us have been seeing it in the popular debate, but more so a process, right? What we want uh, is the ability to do things digitally, to transact digitally. Uh, in the COVID context with the social uh, distancing requirements and restrictions that have been put in place, uh, there's research out there that's showing, that's demonstrating that countries that were more digitally connected, that had a higher level of adoption of broadband connectivity and its use across society are actually positioned to benefit, to mitigate up to 50% of the negative impacts of the economic impacts of COVID that might emerge. We're seeing this, uh, um, uh, a research came out from one of the big, uh, uh, internet domain uh, domain providers, and they identified that by analyzing around 120 million Wi-Fi routers globally, they see that just from home connections, there's more than an 80% increase in upload traffic. And all of it mostly is to cloud platforms like the ones we are using right now. And all of this has happened in the last one year uh, with the onset of social uh, distancing measures. So countries, as a result, and uh, individuals and economies that were, and companies that were not geared and positioned to take advantage of this switch are actually at a higher risk of being left behind. SMEs are being left behind because they haven't been prepared to switch to a digital environment. So the inequalities that exist in the, in the physical world are actually at risk of being expanded and exaggerated by a growing digital divide. So the process of digitizing the economy, as Bevel uh, also noted, is a process of digitizing our mindsets. It's a change in how we think, it's a change in how we operate. And the, the Caribbean region um, is of course uh, taking you know, uh, notice of this and has been investing a lot in trying to 
promote not just digitization at the national level but adopting a, a more partnership based approach towards these resource towards uh, towards sharing resources and ensuring that we can have these kind of outcomes so we see that you know regional integration and digital economy development are very synergetic and almost form a virtuous cycle one reason as you can imagine is um, i mean for every digital entrepreneur the first thing the, one of the first few words you heard here of a scale is scale right like scale and network effects underline uh, the digital economy it, it's it's the the more uh, entities people that you can share information with exchange data and exchange value with the greater value can, you can actually generate so when we look at regional inter integration that by that is so synergetic with developing digital economies uh, because that gives us access to a wider pool of inputs of uh, markets and of talent and information of course and breeds um, breeds innovation amongst uh, amongst the the inhabitants of this community now the caribbean region is really really well placed when you think about that uh, while we end up seeing while we end up hearing about the challenge of scale we forget of the benefits that come from an existing culture of regional coordination. We have uh, certain really, really good mechanisms in place in the region at the CARICOM level, at sub-regional levels, such as the Eastern Caribbean. Um, the Eastern Caribbean is a currency union. Uh, the OECS uh, is, coordinates a lot of agendas across, uh, across the region as well, and we see through partnerships in the past, such as on, on the World Bank side, through the recently closed CARSIP project, and now the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project that I'm a team member on, uh, we're seeing the, 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 the region-first thinking that already exists. The question is, how do we mobilize that to make a sizable impact in enabling our individuals, our businesses, and our governments to adopt greater digital technologies? Um, and in fact, I would even say, let's, let's not even say digital technologies. Today, it's digital transformation. 20 years later, it might be something else. It's, it's about staying abreast with the current technologies and transformations of the time. And today, it happens to be driven by access and use of broadband connectivity to solve problems. Now, the, the, this, of course, requires uh, investments, not only at the national level, but also a lot of coordination at the regional level, right? And that's where, uh, that's where our uh, linkages with regional integration come in. Um, I've, uh, Dr. Remy and Bevel both mentioned a few projects and uh, ideas that kept bringing me back to one big advantage that this sector, the digital space has, over any other physical sector with regards to uh, you know collaborating across borders in a completely non physically connected uh, ways is the fact that this sector has been built on standards it's been a completely private sector led sector right the we uh, i mean when you think of uh, even the telecom market old school telecom that was liberalized uh, more than 30 years 30 40 years ago we've got the, pri uh, the private sector that owns all of our broadband infrastructure globally, pretty much. There are a few, of course, public sector undertakings and all, uh, so on. The digital services industry, completely led by the private sector. In fact, the public sector is only always trying to catch up and try to stay abreast with the with these changes. And we're trying to ensure that consumer interests and so on uh, are protected. Right. So all of these things are uh, are very much led by the private sector. And, and what the public sector can do really is give it, give the private sector, the individuals, the citizens, a platform to honestly go ahead and innovate. And that's where we see the standards and the enabling environment around, uh, around, uh, around the digital economy becoming super important. Uh, one of the areas that uh, Dr. Remy, I, I would really wish you had listed on your areas of uh, you know, enabling environment uh, uh, improvements is just telecom, good old telecom. We need better access to broadband, higher quality broadband and more affordable broadband. The East, the Caribbean region uh, has, I mean, you know, entry level broadband prices range between 3% uh, to 6% of GNI per capita. That's too much. A utility cannot cost so much. 
uh, when we look at quality of service, it's lagging uh, the rest of the uh, Latin America and Caribbean region. And of course, global leaders, you, Singapore, Koreas are talking about one GBPS connectivity to each household. That is, you know, uh, that's, that's where the future is. So simple things like ensuring we have a regulatory environment that can create competitive pressures and allow for greater harmonization of markets across the Caribbean and the telecom space enabling financial uh, transactions online digital financial services to close our uh, to close our banking gaps to enable uh, online transactions particularly today we can't be in a position where we are in the covid uh, pandemic where we are uh, where we have a situation where human beings are aggregating to do something as simple as pay uh, for uh, for a service which could have been very easily done online the enabling environment around this across the caribbean really needs improvement and as we look at these two foundational areas, which is you know access to internet and access to the ability to pay online, that's when we can again also focus on uh, on some of the safeguards and uh, and some of the drivers of what we'd call the data economy. Uh, as more and more people come online and their information comes online, it also increases the whole uh, you know, the risk profile of those particular services, individuals, and uh, and their uh, and their investments. So from that perspective, we also see the, the need to for the region to also look at investing in, um, in cybersecurity, data protection, and privacy regimes, which are not only going to protect consumers, um, build an environment of online trust and safety, but also drive the private sector, right? Because it gives the private sectors the rules of the game. How are they going to work within it? It allows you to design solutions that are tomorrow not going to be on the on on the wrong side of of global international good practices and all of this at the end of the day comes from people <laughs> uh, we can't stress enough uh, at the world bank how important it is to to develop these capabilities amongst individuals to really uh, to to thrive in this innovation, right? Like entrepreneurship doesn't mean creating the new Facebook, creating the new Google. It means within traditional sectors as well, being entrepreneurial within your organization, within your sector to adopt what is available today that takes you one step ahead. Um, as we do more of that, some of us may emerge and be the next few creators. This of course requires significant investment in in terms of you know um, promoting careers in the digital side, there's a huge gender gap in the Caribbean where we we realize we hear that um, you know that women are not and girls are not as uh, as motivated to enter this field, and it is seen as being very male dominated. Again, you're excluding an entire talent pool within the within the region that just shows that maybe the mainstreaming of digital careers of digital um, adoption across our society, across the traditional sectors of the economy is something that we could really work on as well in the region. Uh, and maybe just one quick plug at the end of the Digital Caribbean project and how what we're looking at. So the project here is adopting a regional approach towards digital economy development with supporting investments at the national level. But regionally, at least, the one area where we feel that uh, the, the, and the OECS is in fact playing, a, uh, is playing the key critical uh, coordinating role regionally is working on the enabling environment uh, around four key areas that we feel hopefully would allow for greater standardization and harmonization across the Eastern Caribbean. And these could be models that can then, you know, expand outwards to the CARICOM level, as well as, you know, exchange with other sub-regional groupings, larger regional uh, projects such as the single ICT space, and giving us, you know, common grounds that allow for certain dialogue and standardization to take place. So these four key areas that we're looking at uh, around the legislative and around the enabling environment is telecom, so broadband actually, uh, electronic communications, uh, digital financial services, cybersecurity, and data protection and privacy. So hopefully, uh, by the governments uh, in the region collaborating and the private sector collaborating around these key areas, there'll be a, a greater, let's say, impetus to have a wider single ICT space within the Caribbean, a single digital market within the Eastern Caribbean, and hopefully in the future, a CARICOM-wide, uh, you know, seamless digital market. 
Um, and with that, I think I'm a little bit over my time as well. So I'd like to uh, hand over <laughs> back to Dr. Reed. <laughs> No, Thanks. thank you so very much. No, man, thank you so very much, Himat. In fact, I see persons in the chat saying, fantastic, applaud it, sir. Yes, Mr. Himat, very true. The cost isn't the standard of the high prices. And we actually have someone who said, very true, as you spoke about the gender gap. Um, she said, I was excluded from my job because I am female and that was so wrong. And that is a challenge that still exists within our region, certainly um, some salient points that you, you brought forward um, is that you know the, the digital transformation is not a destination, but it is a process. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. What you said, the ability to do things digitally or to transact digitally, that is really where we're sh we should be trying to go. And as a region, we certainly don't want to get left behind. And so therefore there was some urgency behind what you said about you know, preparing because the lack of preparation is, is, is rooted in the, in, in the inequalities in the world. And so action expands and evolves, so does the growing digital divide. And so we have to prepare and we have to make the necessary moves so that we are not left uh, behind. As you said, so many things that really struck a chord, but I'm going to leave it. We have a lot of questions in the question and answer tab that we know persons are definitely uh, very excited to hear the answers for. So I'm going to go to our very last panelist, and then I am going to take on all of the questions. I'm going to throw them at our panelists and then they will take them on one by one. So that being said, I introduce our very final panelist uh, for this particular panel discussion. And he is Nigel Salino. He is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and a global social impact leader. He's well known for his record shattering performance at the Caribbean's largest insurer. Nigel was appointed chairman and CEO of the global arm of the Caribbean's largest conglomerate in 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, we wait with bated breath to hear from Nigel Salino. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you all for having me this morning at the Sustainable Development Movement. This is the second installment of this, which is now becoming the premier business event in the Caribbean. We are happy to have you join us this morning, and I am thankful to be one of your presenters today. I would like to thank Dr. Didicus Jules and the OECS Commission Lisa Taylor Stone, who is the major organizer of this event. This event that is becoming an annual must attend. So thank you all. And this morning, I would start, like to start off my present, presentation with the following. While we are busy getting permits and scoring through diplomatic layers of drafting legislations, policy and permits, a whole world exists where trillions of dollars and skills are being traded. There is no doubt that Caribbean entrepreneurs compete in a global market that is beaming with opportunities. While we understand this reality and we, res we are responding to change and processes, tools and comprehensive documentation are our main priority. How could Caribbean entrepreneurs be positive to take full advantage of this? Last evening, I was out at dinner with a group of leading business men and women and we were discussing the whole area of Africa and how Africa has leapfrogged over the rest of the world in terms of technology and in terms of digital banking. Africa it has become the number one area for anything to do with digital money. In fact, you could go right to the, the vendor in the market, the farmer in the most remote place in Africa, and they have become sophisticated users of technology. I refer to technology as the great equalizer. Now we have people in the most remote parts of the world who have access at their fingertips to the best technology. The iPhones and the, all the other smartphones that we have, the technology within those phones are better than the technology that took the first man to the moon. So each of us now have the opportunity to have access to the best leading edge technology in the world. And that has become the great equalizer, the great equalizer all over the world. And now what I would like to present to you is the fact that we in the Caribbean have that opportunity to now be partakers 
in some of the most leading technology in the world. We have the opportunity to digitize this entire economy. And as a matter of fact, in that this, the, the discussion we were having last evening, we were talking about how the Central Bank of the Eastern Caribbean now have the, its digital current currency. We are seeing where Jamaica is moving towards that and many other countries in the world where we have Bitcoin, we have cryptocurrency, and that is now allowing um, investors who did not have the chance in the past to now be partakers in this whole new technological revolution. We have young people who are doing things that we, we did not think was imaginable years ago. The titans in the past, people like Rockefeller, the Fords, the JP Morgans, they were the titans and it seemed as if business was only for a certain class of people and success was also only for a certain class of people. Now, we are all part of this great big revolution that is taking place, this technological revolution. And we have technology now leading the banking industry, the automotive industry. Many industries throughout our world are being led through and by technology. And what I would like to do today is to encourage you to take full advantage of all the advancements we have in technology. Now the person who is in the remotest place in Grenada or in St. Lucia or in Dominica now have that opportunity to become a business leader. To, they have the, the opportunity now to be part of that great revolution of which all of us are part of. We have innovators like, for instance, the person who started Tech Beach in Jamaica. When we look at places like there, there is a young man who looked at the whole situation or the challenges we have with Sagasum seaweed, and he was able to, um, to utilize that for fertilizer. And there are many different examples. We have the robotics group out in St. Kitts and Nevis, and that robotics group, they are now world class. Then in some they're they're basically in top of the whole robotics industry if you want to use that term globally they are now able to compete with the best in robotics so there is this notion and this feeling that because we are in the caribbean because we are third world because we are a, sm a small island states that we don't have the capabilities we don't have the potential to be as great as the, the greatest inventors in Silicon Valley and in other parts of the world. But who knows, maybe the next Steve Jobs is in this audience here today. Maybe the next Steve Jobs is part of the small islands that make up the OECS and the islands of CARICOM and the islands of the Caribbean. I have a good friend, um, Charles Ifedi, who um, started InterSwitch. And InterSwitch, when Visa bought 20% of it, they paid $200 million. So it's a billion dollar company. They started off with an investment of $2 million. And that company, the value when, when Visa bought into it was a billion dollar company. And the, the, the um, value continues to increase. We have M-Pesa in Kenya and the, the CFO of um, M-Pesa was Bob Collymore, who was a Guyanese M-Pesa in Kenya. You know, and the person, one of the driving forces was somebody from Guyana. We are, Guyana very soon will become one of the major oil producers in the world. And Exxon, one of the largest companies in the world, they are closing down their operations in other parts of the world to focus on Guyana. Guyana in the south, when we look at Jamaica in the north, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, and other Caribbean countries, we have the capacity, the capacity to be one of the leading regions in the world. And the reason why is because of our size. We may think of, of our size as being a disadvantage, but it's actually an advantage. We have produced great leaders like Errol Barrow, Michael Manley, Dr. Eric Williams. We've had Nobel laureates from St. Lucia. We've had great leaders, leaders like Peter Minchel, the great mass man who did the opening of the... Um, Barcelona Olympics, and also the Atlanta Olympics, the World Cup in 1994 in the US. So of, of all the creative designers in the world, 
a small island like Trinidad and Tobago with just over a million people, Peter Minchel was chosen. And what I would like to leave with you today is that we are as great as or better than anyone else in the world. We have the capacity, we have the potential, we have the capabilities to excel and to reach for the stars. We have the capacity to soar and to get to places unimaginable. I'll leave you with this story, with this last point here. Dr. Eric Williams had the vision to start a petrochemical industry in Trinidad and Tobago. And that put petrochemical industry became one of the top three pe petrochemical estates in the world. And the, the point I'm making here is that we have the capacity, we have the capabilities, we have the potential to be as great as or better than most in this world. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, uh, what a way to end um, this panel discussion. You know, that was uh, just a great reminder that we have the capabilities, we have the potential, we have the, the, the talent. And of course, everyone has been saying that. I think what most people are trying to figure out is how do we now push that needle from us acknowledging and knowing that we have the capabilities to there being uh, the platforms and the accelerators and the different programs that can now allow us to have this uh, mainstream appeal. You know, you, you hear about these individual groups, the robotics, the, you know, this, that, but it, it would be lovely if we had it as a mainstream, right? For it to not just be Jamaica known for sun, fun, music, and, you know, dancing and sports, but to also be, you know, recognized as having robotics and the same for Trinidad and Tobago. So I guess this is what we're talking about. The integration and getting to a level where our capabilities and talent can be exported without all of this drama and regulatory uh, madness. So we have tons of questions. And so I'm going to start fielding it to the various um, panelists. So Dr. Remy, you're up. You know, how can we get the conversation going with local entrepreneurs who are already working on projects to get the proper support instead of importing foreign services where the transfer of knowledge is usually not, uh, um, not paid attention to? Good question. Very good question. Um, and I really learned a lot from my fellow panelists because many of them are in the trenches. I mean, these are people who have worked. I mean, it was very interesting to me to hear from Mr. Wooding um, that I, I don't know if it was I explicitly said, but I think you wanted to start obviously in the Caribbean, but maybe your real propulsion to do anything came from being outside of the region. I don't know if that's an indictment on the, the frameworks we have here, which allow somebody like you to start a business and grow it in the Caribbean. And I think that brings me to answer in the question, which is I know people specifically and personally who have tried these software businesses in the region. They have tried to develop and grow a software business and some of the problems you have is the lack of actually skilled people who actually can can, can do some of this work uh, and you wonder then if it is that the, there's a failure of the education system a failure of the enabling environment i know that a lot of the universities now i mentioned one with huawei i know they exist at cable in guyana creating these incubators and outside of the university context you have different attempts through Tech Beach and others, 10 Habitat, to create these incubators where the idea is fused with the expertise and eventually the idea is to attract this angel investing. So there seems to be a cognition of the, the fact that there needs to be that enabling environment, but somehow, and, and I, I actually will defer to the others on the panel, it's not, a lot of it is not taking root, a lot of it is not being scaled a lot of it is not coming to fruition and you wonder whether it's one thing or another or just the ecosystem is not enabling enough because we cannot attract the investment to take it from that step um, to the next and i'm not saying that every i, I see a, a response i'm not saying that every every problem is related to a lack of skill i'm saying that from people i've spoken to some of the issues are you hire young people and it's either the work ethic or uh, you know, the the, the, the the technical skills need to be a little bit more deployed to the practicalities instead of being theoretical. So you, you have to question whether the way we're developing it in the region, what, what really is the failure in the model? And I, I will defer to others to explain what that might be, what the problem might be with bringing many of these wonderful ideas to actual fruition. 
But I'll just say on funding because that seems to be a huge issue. A big topic. That's an issue. Mm -hmm. Whether it's from our local indigenous banks and the risk profile or what are the uh, the actual uh, problems relating to um, the, the types of grants we receive. Um, it's, it's, it's a bigger question, um, and I wonder whether or not any of the other panelists um, can, can, can weigh in on some of these issues, how they have been able to be successful in their fields. All right, let's throw the question. Let's throw the question. Thank you, Dr. Remy. Um, it, it's a massive question, naturally. Um, uh, Bevel, Himat, is there anything that you would like to add to that in terms of why this, uh, this, 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 this issue? Definitely. I, I, let, me, let me just build on what Dr. Remy was saying. The, it is a very nuanced consideration, but it's not a mysterious one. Uh, we, we have the talent in the region. Of that, I am absolutely certain. And I, I'll give you a, a bit of the basis for the certainty. Uh, some years ago, about 10 years ago, the Caribbean Telecommunications Union undertook a Caribbean ICT roadshow going to every country in English speaking Caribbean and some in the Dutch Caribbean um, to promote ICTs and the benefits of the development and so on. And in every territory from Montserrat to Jamaica, um, we found that there were individuals capable of running shoulder to shoulder with anyone anywhere else in the world. So the, the, the issues, and I'm not saying that, that you don't have work ethic issues in some places or that you don't have individuals who aren't appropriately skilled, obviously um, you can't cast such a generalization. But what I'm saying is the talent pool and the potential exists within the region. Here's where it gets complicated. If a company, if a firm or if an individual has an idea that they think can be developed into something that a business can be built around and that can be sustained, uh, that funding issue comes straight to the fore. So where are we getting the capital? Uh, for most in the region, the banks will not take intangible assets as sufficient guarantee in their risk portfolio and profiles. And when you compare and contrast with other areas uh, of the world where technological businesses have thrived, you recognize that there are other forms of funding typically available. Those aren't available in the same, to the same degree within the region. Now I say to the same degree, because there are some persons who are trying to do versions of angel funding, um, venture funding, and so on. But that requires that itself requires an ecosystem to create the education and the awareness. Uh, it requires a different level of understanding of the fundamentals of business and cash flow that the, the typical Caribbean innovator, and again, I say typical, not making a generalization, but the typical Caribbean innovator who might be focused on a technical solution may not have the either the capacity or the time to focus on the other aspects of business development. And so this issue of the, the digital economy uh, or the knowledge economy being an ecosystem is fundamental to understanding what makes it sustainable or not. We have to have that funding mechanism in place, but we also have to have we also have to have the supporting uh, elements for business development in place and intellectual property and legal support and contracting um, that whole ecosystem again has to be available to an entrepreneur for a business idea to take root and to become sustainable. And that's where a lot of the um, the great ideas basically crash and burn because you have you have a technical solution but you don't have the market penetration capability. You don't have the market analysis um, capability. You don't have the, the networks of persons and you don't have something he might put his finger on. You don't have the scale. So if you start mm -hmm. local, you, your local market typically will not afford you the, the, the opportunity in terms of revenues and incomes to support the cost of development. The sustainability. That's correct. And I, I, let me let me give a, a, a very quick and simple example from, from Apex. We built the, the, the Caribbean's first um, case management, um, comprehensive case management uh, solution, cloud-based, mobile-friendly, et cetera, et cetera. But we built it on a shoestring budget based on gifts, financial gifts from some of the governments in the region. At the same time, we were building that with less than a million dollars in funding. The, the government of Singapore tossed 30 million US to an exercise that was designed to do one module of what we were doing a suite for. So we had e-filing and case management and performance management and, um, and so on. They tossed 30 million US to just the e-filing component. And I remember bringing that to the board and saying, 
Do you understand what this means? It means they're not just funding development, they're funding the documentation, they're funding the, mag the magistrate and the judiciary and the legal association mentality shift. They're funding the profiling and public education necessary to allow people to put it on. That's the true cost of the service. So if they bring that solution to the Caribbean, what are we competing with? Our good intention? <laughs> So, so, so those become the issues when somebody says, we don't want to take local because there are world-class solutions out there. And then mm -hmm. they spend the money to pay for those world-class solutions that could have gone into developing a world-class solution right here in the Caribbean. But Bevel, mm -hmm. I just want to, and I know we don't have time, but what I, I agree with you that the talent in the region is phenomenal. But why is it that we're not getting enough investment here to, to make it scalable? Why is it that we're not, people are not coming here to invest in our local talent? What is the issue? Hey Matt, is it that people don't take us seriously? Is it that because the region is known for fun, sun and tourism that, you know, they don't, they're not aware that we have this talent pool? What, 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 is, what do you, what do you think? So this is a really tricky one, right? Because there's, there's, there's no way of addressing it without coming across as uh, generalizing, but I'm going to try and walk this fine line that Bevel just did a very good job of uh, of leading. So, I think I one thing that Bevel said uh, that often gets overlooked again, and it's it's part of this you know mentality shift of looking at digital transformation, modernization as a process and not as a destination or an end to itself, right? Uh, which is that. While you, while there's a lot of great technical solutions out there, and you know you cannot even, we won't even know how many amazingly unique products are in this chat right now. Who somebody has created something we have no idea. The problem is, the the idea when you look at the valuation of a company as well tomorrow for investment purposes for anything, an idea is four percent, ninety six percent comes from its implementation, how it is. Structured, executed. factored, executed, scaled, how it is planned for. The idea itself on a balance sheet is goes down as goodwill for the largest company, whether it is Apple or whether it's the first one coming out as an IPO or whether it's, you know, I don't know, Bevel's uh, first enterprise that would have looked for financing. That is goodwill, which will not be more than 4% of your balance sheet. So let's just firstly stop thinking that it's a lack of ideas. Or also assume that, you know, just because I have a great idea, I, I should have a great business and then feel victimized when my idea doesn't become a business. That's not true. Bad ideas become great businesses <laughs> because you have to focus on that side of things. So when it comes to the entrepreneurship, and uh, I would say that the, the, the Caribbean needs to do more in terms of providing the enabling environment for the entrepreneurs. I completely agree with that. Uh, it need we need the right digital enabling environment. We need good quality internet available to everybody. We need standard. Um, we need a more standardized, let's say, uh, you know, data exchange and data governance regime that will allow for these innovators. Like today, if I come up with a solution in Saint Lucia that let's say adheres to the rules in Saint Lucia, what if I cannot export it to? Trinidad and Tobago, which maybe I see as a largest market, but they've ad adhered to a different data standard. There you go. My solution suddenly is, is useless, right? Like I need to invest all the same amount of time in creating it to adhere to something else, maintain two parallel sets of my solution. Why, why would I do that? So why don't the governments come together and say that, okay, just the way, I don't know, the data set and industry without any international coordination has come out with amazing standards that it uses. When tomorrow you, if I want to uh, get data center space in Central Asia, I can do that sitting here, right? Because it will tell me whether that data center is tier A, B, C, D, uh, one, two, three, four, follows ISO standards, blah, blah, blah. Put all of it together. I have exact mental image of what this data center is capable of doing and not capable of doing. The same, same thing, just... Why can't we apply that to a wider digital ecosystem? Use standards, use harmonization and interoperability. There's no need to give up sovereignty as well. That's often a fear that you know we have as individuals, as institutions, and as countries. You don't give up sovereignty when you talk about interoperability. You don't need to say that I'm 
releasing some power to a higher authority. It's not that. It's we are all coordinating to come to a higher level so that all of us look at ourselves and each other from a bit of a higher plane so that we can see where all these synergies and intermingling pieces are going. Yeah, exactly. Well, listen, listen, Himat, I'm so sorry to, to, I mean, they gave me extra time in this session. We had 12 questions and literally we only happen to answer one. So this is what I'm going to do. The chat was very fiery. I don't know if you saw the questions and even the suggestions. I love the type of engagement and the, the caliber of participants that we have here. We've launched a poll uh, for you to give us your feedback. For the questions that have not been answered, what we will do is we will actually send those questions to our, uh, our panelists so that we can actually feed you the answers. Uh, maybe in the form of an email, because we do want to answer your questions. That's the reason why you're here. We just needed some more time for this particular uh, for this particular session. But to my panelists, Dr. Remy, uh, to Bevan, Mr. Wooding, um, and uh, Mr. Sandu, and of course, Nigel Salina, thank you so very much for your time. This was absolutely fantastic. Please go ahead and complete the poll and look forward to the poll after each uh, session. Coming up next uh, on your break, you can go and you can view the exhibits, but coming up, we have two concurrent sessions. One, technology innovations, value chains, agribusiness, speaking the language of youth innovators. That sounds very good. And the other one is building a resilient food system in the Caribbean. Food security is such a big deal. So go take your break, view your exhibits, go to the auditorium and choose which one of those concurrent sessions you would like to join. Thank you for your participation and your questions. We will try to get your answers. Do take care. See you later. Thank you.